So I now invite Professor Bhaskar Datta for the first lecture in SRIP lecture series. Professor Datta will uh, talk on uh, two mysteries. So let's welcome Professor Datta. Okay. Good afternoon, all. Good afternoon. Seems like you haven't had breakfast. Good afternoon. Okay, that's better. Uh, so I know there are uh, some of our students uh, in the audience. And a few things that I might talk about would be familiar to those students. Uh, but that's not an excuse for you to leave. Uh, that means you need to pay even more attention to what I'll be talking about. Uh, welcome to IIT Gandhinagar. A very formal welcome uh, to those who have traveled long distance uh, to be here. Uh, we really appreciate your interest in the research that uh, we are doing at IIT Gandhinagar. And we hope you have a very productive time, um, as Director Professor Jain has pointed out, uh, being mindful of several other ways of uh, enriching your experience um, at the Institute. All right, so what I wanted to discuss here were a few things which I would like to highlight uh, uh, what an intern should be thinking about, what an intern, what a research intern should uh, be focusing on, be thinking about, especially if uh, some of you, this is your very first experience, very first research experience. Uh, it'll be a short experience, uh, but uh, short and sweet, so there might be a lot more that you learned from this short experience than what you would have if you spent uh, months at end. Uh, I remember my first internship uh, experience, uh, which was someplace in Delhi, and in fact, I also hail from Delhi, so the highlight of that internship was uh, not the work itself, but the commute. I had to commute a long distance, and this was uh, the, before the days of public transport and uh, metro, and that itself became an adventure, <coughs> daily adventure. Uh, we hope it doesn't become a commuting adventure for you. We know that you're all on campus, and uh, you'll have a, a great time uh, going back and forth from the academic area to the hostel area, especially in the middle of the afternoon when it's 45 degrees and blazing. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, a larger number of dining options in the academic area, uh, but that's okay. You know, the heat is something that you have to get used to. Uh, so there has to be some mystery <coughs> to the experience that you are that's going to unfold in front of you, and and certain kinds of mysteries uh, could be just solved by waiting out. Right. So I'm sure some of you have been here for maybe a week, ten days, uh, two weeks maybe, and you know already you have understood the uh, feeding pattern in the mess. That's not a mis mystery anymore. In fact, I would hazard to say if you had the breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you more or less know what's going to come up uh, for the remaining months at end. Uh, the mess food here is good, but you know it becomes a bit monotonous at times. Uh, if, let's say, uh, they were earlier planning to have this session sometime last week, and I thought the mystery at that time would be uh, how the BJP government was going to prove its numbers in Karnataka. Uh, but you know that has passed now. So that's the kind of mystery which you don't need to solve. You can just wait it out and it will solve itself. Uh, the mystery right now for you know, cricket fans uh, is who's going to be the IPL champion. Again, you, know, you can fight amongst yourselves, but at the end of the day, come Sunday, that winner will be decided. So this is not that kind of mystery. It's something which you have to actively engage in and do something so that it uh, solves itself. Uh, before uh, you can go forward. So in uh, keeping with a very traditional way of uh, conveying thoughts and uh, learnings to people in our country, which is through folk tales, uh, through stories, and you have the moral of the story and the motto of the story. So I'm not, hopefully I won't sound very preachy, there'll be no morals, but there'll be certain things which are quite uh, explicit in these two mysteries which I will be talking about. Uh, these have been chosen with some amount of thought. One of this is no longer a mystery. It was a mystery, but it has since been solved. The second is still a mystery to some extent. The reason I'm talking to you about this is multifold. I'd like to highlight several uh, several dimensions of work that you might be uh, interested in. Uh, there are several approaches that you might want to use when you go about doing your internship. And there will also be a, a, a number of very implicit, uh, very intangible, hidden messages which are given out. So 
the first mystery that I'm going to talk about uh, is not a story that's native to India. It's something that happened in a very far away land. And I'm using this story to highlight uh, several key aspects of your behavior as a student, as a researcher, as a prospective future scientist, researcher, academician. What are the things which you should, you want to introspect and, and grow as a person on? Each of these will be highlighted on the first line, as in, you know, the, the top bullet, that will highlight what it is about. And the remaining slide and the remaining picture will go into the actual story. So I just want to spell it out for this first mystery. In the second mystery, it will not be done. It will just be the mystery itself. We'll talk about it. And hopefully, you'll also learn something new. Uh, and I'm sure these two, as I said, I give the disclaimer for those students who might have already seen this. But for the rest, I hope uh, it is something new. All right, so the first mystery has to do with uh, something that happened uh, close to 30 odd years back uh, in Canada. What you're seeing here are, uh, is what? What is this? I'm hearing shh sh sh all over. Yeah, so this is shellfish. And uh, I know there are a lot of vegetarians out there. Uh, so you can probably close your eyes and uh, shut your ears, but for some reason fish is very non-controversial, it's not controversial enough. So I think that's a good way of making sure all your vegetarians and non-vegetarians remain together for the rest of this discussion. Now this is shellfish and about 30 odd years back, uh, there was a serious outbreak of uh, some sort of a, a food poisoning, some sort of an illness which had to do with consumption of uh, this shellfish and it became very serious. Uh, there were areas which were closed off completely for the shellfish uh, not only to be captured but also to be used and then uh, you know, to be cooked subsequently. And naturally this was a very serious mystery. This was in that time when we didn't suspect one another of being the cause. So if this had, had happened today, you know, probably some of you would be thinking, who's up to this? Who's done this? So this was from an age when we still were a bit uh, innocent in that respect. We still hadn't suspected that it would be a human being who would do this. It would probably be some kind of natural phenomenon which was leading to this poisoning. And this has since been called the amnesic shellfish poisoning mystery. The mystery there is, of course, redundant. Once we get to the end of it, we'll come to the solution. So it won't remain a mystery anymore. But when it happened, it was a mystery. Nobody really knew what was going on. OK, so how did things first start? So the power of observation, this is what physicians do all the time. And sometimes you think what they're doing is very trivial. They're just recording your pulse. They're looking at what your symptoms are. Uh, but this power of observation is very crucial as a researcher. And believe it or not, you're exercising it day in and day out for things that you like and are passionate about. And if you're like and passionate about your work, then you'd be as observant, uh, not less. So these are some of the symptoms which were recorded for the amnesic shellfish poisoning mystery. Uh, none of this was a giveaway. It, it didn't have any symptom which said, oh, that symptom makes it sound like it's this poison. And therefore, we have identified what the poisoning is. That didn't happen. These are fairly uh, low key symptoms in terms of uh, what might have caused the poisoning. And uh, since this was primarily happening in people who had consumed the shellfish, from different restaurants, so it was not just one food chain, it was not one chef, uh, this was not clearly not something that humans had control over at this point. Uh, they were unable to diagnose what the problem would be. That being said, they had their suspects. Uh, you know, 30 odd years back, uh, it was still not uh, primitive times, you know, science had advanced uh, a lot and there were known agents which could elicit the same kind of response in people. These are some of the suspected agents. So this is somewhat like creating a hypothesis, but I don't want to, you know, highlight that because this is just the way of thinking that, okay, we know the symptoms, what could, it, what could cause these problems and therefore let's look at each of these uh, one by one and let's see if we can solve the problem uh, or not. Uh, so the tests that uh, were performed with some of these muscles uh, yielded very different results. There were two in particular that were very surprising because the uh, blue muscle and the paralytic shellfish 
poisons on the mice, uh, these produced very different results, and that was again a very confusing aspect of this story. It t told people that it was not entirely the sea fish itself, it was probably something else also. Maybe the, the sea fish was growing in a certain place in the ocean, or maybe it was the way they were being caught. That procedure was different in certain batches of sea fish, which made it different. Maybe, these are all speculations, which uh, they had to prove in order to uh, get ahead. So the strategy at that point became, okay, let's not worry right now about what the actual poisoning agent will be. Let's follow through in a very systematic format. Let's try to extract these substances. Let's try to take them out from the food and compare the action of the extracted substances versus known agents, and then we'll try to get a match, and that sounds like the most logical way of doing things. Right, so the extraction strategy is essentially a very systematic process of doing work. And systematic does not only mean working uh, from 9 a.m. till 6 p.m. It also means you are recording, you are documenting, you are talking to people in ways that make uh, that systematic work, capture that systematic work, and make sure that you can reproduce it and, and so on. So this uh, systematic work that was performed is shown here, uh, and I know this is a very diverse audience, and the purpose of this talk is uh, not to get into the technical details excessively, but yes, I would like to explain a few things because I am talking about a mystery that was solved using science. So we will try and understand some of the key steps that went on in uh, solving this particular challenge. Uh, so there was a separation that was performed from the extract. There was a bioassay, and even if you're not from these fields, you would understand what this is conveying, is that the substance was administered to somebody, not a human being, hopefully, but somebody, uh, or some organism, and you then try to see the response from that organism, and then you try to see which organism got knocked out and which organism survived, and based on that, you could then test that particular organism further, right? So that is the strategy that is mentioned here. The lower part is talking about some ways by which people wanted to identify what that substance was, what was the chemical or biochemical substance. Is it one substance, multiple substances? Do they have to be together? All of that is, is conveyed in this lower half right here. Right? So the technique or the process used, again, going back to the systematic method, and so when you're starting out your internship from the first day onwards, you should be worried about knowing the logical flow of work and making sure that you are completely aware of defects in your own knowledge that you might have, which you might not have a chance to address during this internship, but you know for sure that that's something I would like to learn in future. So it's a good uh, idea to have a work plan uh, in place and try to follow that work plan as much as possible. The work plan that these people developed uh, was essentially using a lot of this technique called chromatography, which I'll briefly highlight because I'm talking about it, so I'll just talk about chromatography a little bit. Uh, and they use chromatography and then try to solve what are the different substances present in this extract. And the substances which were taken out, you determine the structure of that and you try and compare it with known substances and you can then try to find out if you have indeed a match for the extracted uh, so-called poison or not. So two halves of the work. One half would require the extraction, the second half would require assessment. Maybe you are one individual who is working in the team which is doing the extraction, right, metaphorically speaking, and you have a whole team which is working on the back-end stuff. That doesn't make your work more or less important than the rest. So the collective effort uh, in its entirety is absolutely essential for the uh, challenge to be addressed. All right, since we are talking about chromatography, uh, what chromatography means is measuring the interaction between substances, and if you can do that in a format, which allows you to separate the substances which interact strongly versus the substances which interact not as strongly, then lo and behold, you have a method of separation. So this is a very easy to understand pictorial. You have flowers, you have insects, bees, hovering over the flowers, and you have the flowers laid out, and you have the most persistent of those insects 
you'll be winning out in a certain race if you could do that. So you have probably separated out the insects in terms of which ones are more diligent in terms of smelling the flowers versus the ones which are not as diligent in terms of smelling the flowers, which is essentially capturing all of chromatography. So if you've identified the flowers, which is one substance, and the insects, which is the thing which you have extracted, which you're trying to analyze, and you place them together, and you have a way of separating out the events as they are occurring, then at the end what you get is a series of events where some substances are, are adhering strongly, some are not, some are flowing through faster, and others are not. And so you have the ability to release these agents at different points of time. And so if you are sitting there on the bench, making sure that all the substances which are part of that extract will come out of this device over a period of time, you can keep collecting them in fractions, and then you can keep using them in terms of assaying and trying to understand what they are made of. Right? So this is just the extent of chromatography that I'm going to uh, discuss. Uh, the way in which this appears is interesting. However, it's a very easy to understand format in the way in which this whole uh, event is playing out. And uh, what you're going to see, therefore, is a series of peaks in the data that you collect. Uh, and that happens because you will be able to identify species which are separated completely versus this mixture which is present at one instant and only one of the species which is present separately. So the challenge, the first challenge that these uh, people who were working on the amnesic shellfish poisoning was to develop the conditions by which they could separate things which had been extracted from the shellfish, right? The shellfish is an organism, it's a very complex organism, a complex set of cells. So they wanted to separate things which are present in the organism, in certain parts of the organism, try to identify anything which appears foreign, which is not usually part of that organism, and which can therefore be then further tested uh, in terms of its action. So this is how the uh, substances which are coming out over a different period of time will appear. You have a plot which has a y-axis and an x-axis, and the y-axis has uh, some sort of measure of intensity. The x-axis has a time. As I said, you're sitting on your bench, just sitting there observing each of these substances as it's coming out from the device. What you've effectively done is you've able to separate and collect each of these different uh, substances which are part of the mixture. And you can calculate parameters and you can say that, okay, this particular substance has such and such retention time, it has such and such retention factor and so on, blah, 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 blah. So it's very easy to parameterize this data and it's able to, you can document it and your supervisor will be very happy if you did that. So the chromatography part of the experiments were performed. This obviously was done over a significant amount of time and a lot of people were involved. It turned out that there were substances in the aqueous or the water soluble fraction from the shellfish which were more toxic than substances in the oil soluble or the organic soluble fraction. Which made sense because we are actually consuming much more water than oil uh, irrespective of food cuisines worldwide, people generally consume far more water than they consume oil. And substances which are more soluble in water therefore have greater chances of causing more harm compared to substances which have greater solubility in oils. These are all tips for the future person who will design the best poison, which is to come up with a poison that is more water soluble and therefore can cause more harms. No, it's not as straightforward as that. Uh, this is indicating the fact that you have water soluble substances coming out and there can be very well defined fractions which you can clearly identify as being the toxic fraction. That is the substance which is the poison. All right, so the physical, the tedium has been achieved now, as Professor Jan pointed out. Some of this might be essential for your projects. You might have to go day in and day out and keep churning out data just because it fits into the larger scheme of things. But if you didn't do that, then you wouldn't be able to work forward and then try and identify the next more burning question, which is, okay, you've identified what that toxic fraction is, but what actually is it? And how is it causing harm? Uh, and those are the questions which, uh, uh, which will require a slightly more longer uh, term effort. All right, so I'm just illustrating here uh, some of the experiments which were done to understand and identify the 
toxicity of these extracts at each stage. Uh, what you're seeing there scribbled on the right side are mice. So unfortunately, mice had to be the organisms which were sacrificed. They didn't have a choice. Uh, and that is very sad, but then what to do? Our lives are more important than uh, mouse lives. Uh, and so there were certain fractions which were clearly more poisonous compared to the other fractions. And you notice that this has been, uh, this is over four or five different rounds and clearly very large number of extracts which are being brought through the process day in and day out. Just trying to emphasize the importance of tedium in scientific research, right? So please do not downplay it. It's something that is going to clearly help you if you do it well in answering the burning questions and the more and the larger questions that might be there. All right, so bottom line at this stage, people were able to develop methods by which they could um, identify what is the poisonous agent or agents in the shellfish that their folks were consuming and falling sick. So what next? What came next was trying and identify what that substance would be. And this is where chromatography came in very useful. That is why I gave you this very short primer on chromatography. And chromatography was able to tell people that there were certain foreign substances in the extracts from the toxic muscles, which is indicated by a star, which were not present in muscles which had been grown elsewhere in Canada, not in that particular geographic location. This was absent there, and it clearly showed that, yes, there was a certain geographic preference for the toxicity of the muscles. Uh, muscles are less evolved than us, believe it or not, and they therefore could not just make it up that let's one day become poisonous and start poisoning the people of Canada in this region to take revenge for the century-wide suppression that we have faced. Now, it didn't happen like that, so there was clearly something uh, far more, uh, you can say, greater science was involved in why only certain kinds of muscles were more toxic and not everything. So this, the problem was clearly not to do with the shellfish by itself. It was not an inherent problem of all shellfish. There was something else which was adding to that problem. Uh, this goes to the point of proving something, as the title there says. So if you're trying to prove something, Make sure that you have, you keep an open mind. You can't just keep going saying that, no, I will keep prove it that the muscles are at fault and no matter what anyone says, I know that the muscles did it intentionally. No, they did not. It clearly shows that there were other people in the group which were not as poisonous. So while you're going headstrong trying to prove something, make sure that you look at all of your data correctly. You talk to people as has been pointed out. You discuss your ideas and you try to find out the best solution. So clearly, calmer heads prevailed over this particular topic. There were others who were working on different methods, and they started putting all of their information together, which I'm not going to try and explain, because this is the stuff of at least two different lectures, uh, and uh, this is not the purpose of this session right now. But some, uh, suffice it to say that what all of the other groups started doing uh, eventually boiled down to the presence of this one particular chemical compound called domoic acid. The name itself sounds evil. It also has acid in it, which makes it even more powerful sounding. And uh, the domoic acid was clearly the substance that was at fault here. Uh, the identity of domoic acid was proved uh, quite conclusively. Uh, based on the collective evidence that had been put together. So putting this all together is an important task as interns in short summer research projects, you may or may not get the opportunity to see the larger puzzle coming together, right? to see your prototype coming together, see how your small sub-program works in a larger program, or how the procedure that you worked out in a chemistry lab works out in the larger scheme of things. You may not have the luxury to do that. However, the fact that you're doing something which is extremely critical for the larger question to be solved should make you even more passionate and diligent in pursuing your goals and trying to solve. Uh, none of this would have been successful if there were people who were not willing to come together and play with one another. 
That's right. So domoic acid was the faulty substance. Was that it? No, it was not. There has to be continuous follow-up that is done. That is also the nature of scientific research, which is that you don't sit down contently and say, oh, now I've proved it. Now I can live happily ever after, like the end of the movie. No, it doesn't work like that. Uh, there might be something more and something even after that, which makes it possible somebody could question your conclusions at the initial stage. So there was a lot of follow-up. People did follow up with this domoic acid, and they saw that the way in which the domoic acid works, this is a dose-dependent curve. So what this means is on the x-axis, you have the amount of the poisonous substance which is being administered, and the y-axis is a measure of damage which it is incurring. And you follow this dose-dependent curve, which does follow similar patterns of dose-dependent uh, behavior for poisonous substances. So it was clearly showing that, yes, this is not acting in, uh, in concert with other substances. It's probably acting by itself. It doesn't need other substances to help uh, exert its poisonous behavior. It's good enough by itself. And so it seems like we have our fellow, it seems like we have solved the mystery once and for all. Uh, well, that was correct. Uh, this highlights the value of teamwork. There's a huge team that was put together to solve this particular mystery. Uh, the, the team involved everyone, right from lawyers to scientists. Of course, there were legal issues involved here because the food extracts obtained were not necessarily only from one restaurant or from one food source. They were obtained from all over. There were problems with that in terms of legally implicating somebody. Uh, right to scientists and different domains of science uh, coming together and trying to solve this. And the problem was solved in, believe it or not, approximately 100 hours, which is not a very long period of time. That doesn't mean they worked continuously for four days. That didn't happen, but it was still not a long wait of months. It was a matter of days before the problem was solved. So this highlights the importance of a systematic and systemic approach to problem solving. That being said, this is still a problem which has been forced upon you. And I'm sure none of you are working on identifying poisons right now. So you're not working on problems which have been forced upon you. It's, these are probably problems which are extremely critical, which you need to address, but which don't need to be addressed within the next couple of days. So you do have time at your disposal. When you have time at your disposal, what you should also be doing is to ask questions of why. So, so far I've not even answered the question why. Why is this particular domoic acid so poisonous? How is it that it was found in only some of the sheaf, uh, shellfish and not found in a large number of other uh, shellfish? Uh, the why was answered a bit later. Uh, the why took time to answer. The why is take time to answer. It's the burning question in a large section of the natural and physical sciences that takes a lot of time to answer. Sometimes it's very hard to answer. Uh, you have to be mindful of asking the question, why? But having said that, you also need to be sure you are doing the daily tedium work in order to be able to ask the question of why. Please don't use the question of why as an excuse not to do your work and only to do your socializing. That should not be the way forward uh, at all. OK, a few thoughts on this particular challenge. And the reason I'm putting this up, even though this is not a lecture on forensics or on the toxicology aspect, is to understand uh, some of the reasons why these, this group of people were so successful in uh, 100 hours, something that might have taken 100 days uh, otherwise to solve. Uh, poisonous substances toxic substances abound in nature. Right? We really don't have a huge encyclopedia of them. That list keeps growing because our understanding is still fairly limited in terms of what constitutes uh, poisoning and what does not. Uh, and so interpreting the qualitative results, uh, the quantitative results uh, uh, has to take into account the individual consideration. So some of us may not react to substances in the same way as others there's a certain uh, difference in response that we might get. Uh, there are toxic substances which elicit a vast range of responses that might require a variety of other tests as well. So it will be, be very hard for us to conclusively say that, ah, now I know that this is because of such and such substance that the poisoning happened. Uh, the reason this mystery could be solved so fast is because of the following 
points. And so this indicates very clearly that you're trying to go deeper and try to understand what exactly has been solved here. While the mystery has been solved, it is also true that the substance is water soluble, as has been already indicated to you. They were also present in very large concentrations. So the muscles were clearly tolerant of this particular substance. The muscles themselves were not getting affected by this particular substance. And they were able to use tests for assaying toxicity, which were very convenient, on-site tests. The on-site test is not referring to mouse which was captured and taken to the site. No, they had other clinical tests which they could run on-site. The unfortunate mice had to be kept in the lab and injected and sacrificed when the need arise. And the culprit was found readily available in chemical literature and that was also something which helped further this particular line of research. So the uh, precedence was there. Uh, just that it hadn't been implicated previously in this type of poisoning. The substance was known. It had a certain literature to it. People had dug up, dug up about it, and therefore they put two and two together, and they were able to solve everything. So while there were advantages going, you also clearly see that there has been uh, an effort made to exploit those advantages and to make sure that the advantages are useful for you in the long run. Right, so let's summarize the first part. Uh, before I do that, so uh, just the reasons for the toxicity, why it is uh, poisonous. Uh, so it turns out it's looking very similar in structure to something that all of us have uh, in fairly large amounts in our bodies, which is this amino acid. Uh, it's called glutamic acid, which is a very important uh, part of our uh, nervous signaling pathways and it's because of the resemblance here of domoic acid that it starts mimicking the natural counterpart and therefore throws off the body's normal mechanism of responding to nervous signal. This was the reason for why it took some time for people to figure out this particular reason uh, but eventually it was solved. What was it that made this particular substance reside in only certain kinds of shellfish? I'm not going to disclose that. I'll encourage you all to check it out why it was present in only certain kind of shellfish and not others. It was not a human being who did that. It was some kind of a natural phenomenon which made sure only certain kind of shellfish went and uh, took up this particular poison and it wasn't other kinds of shellfish which did it. All right. So the <laughs> Reasons for toxicity, I've already mentioned this, so I'll skip this. So we have gone over a few morals of this first mystery, which has now been successfully solved. Didn't take people to uh, more than 100 hours to solve it. Even the why was solved uh, in about six months' time. Uh, so all of this will be part of your research work, whether it is this current internship that you are part of, or any future research that you are part of. Uh, whether you want to or not, the ecosystem will encourage you to work in a format that allows you to observe carefully, that allows you to work in teams, to keep an open mind, to make conclusions, try and prove them comprehensively, and to use uh, curiosity as the constant driving force when you're trying and addressing your challenges. That was the first mystery. The second mystery is something that I will not emphasize. I will not emphasize what are the key underlying messages that, are, uh, that I would like to otherwise uh, have because we've already given you certain trailers in terms of what these messages are, second mystery. The second mystery is also closer to us. It's closer to our home. Uh, it's a bit morbid, uh, but I'll try to change the mood of the class at the end so I can guarantee you that the mood will lighten up by the end we are done with this mystery, by the time we are done with this mystery. Uh, this has to do with the murder of a little girl uh, that had been captured uh, a lot by the media, became a media spectacle even. And uh, it was uh, an unusual story because it was not just a tale of a crime, but it also was an interesting perspective into certain kinds of psychology which are rampant in our society, in Indian society, especially in certain economic strata of our society. The kind of discussions, judgments, perceptions, all of that also came out. And so if you could look at one comprehensive story which can capture a lot of science and a lot of psychology, this is something that comes up from the very recent past. 
This is the uh, overall premise. For those of you who may not be familiar with the story, uh, this is about a double murder that took place about five, uh, sorry, 10 years back. Uh, and uh, initially the suspect was the household help. Uh, then the suspect changed to the parents because the household help was found to have been killed as well. Uh, and eventually the uh, parents were implicated, they were tried for murder, and uh, they were found guilty uh, about five years back of this double murder. So two murders, both of which the blame was laid on uh, at the feet of the parents. And that's what I mean when I said it provided a very interesting perspective into the psychology of social discussions surrounding uh, uh, such gory events. There was one thing which uh, was uh, remarkable about this entire sordid tale. And that remarkable piece had to do with the complete ineptness with which the forensic part of the investigation was handled. So I'm contrasting here something which was done in the first mystery where you saw a systematic approach, a very logical, sometimes tedious approach from 30 years back when people didn't have access to uh, faster means of solving problems to something which is very close to the nation's capital and people did have access to far more sophisticated tools than which were present 30 years back. And for whatever reason, those were not used and it paints a sorry picture for all of us to say that the entire investigation was extremely inept and uh, just missed a number of vital points. There were a couple of points which have been highlighted since in uh, in novels and in documents and in this movie that I had shown the picture of. This was probably the most effective in informing people about some of the drawbacks in the investigation. There was one particular piece of that evidence which has been highlighted ever since. There was a hand -soaked fin uh, blood soaked handprint which was found on the terrace of this particular apartment. And uh, that has been highlighted time and again as being a possible clue which has since been destroyed, lost, and which could have otherwise provided uh, a significant amount of evidence as to what happened. It was a blood-soaked handprint. Uh, so if it's a blood-soaked handprint on the wall, that clearly means that it cannot just be an innocent activity being done. It shows a certain uh, origin of that blood of the crime and therefore of whoever were the perpetrators. So I'd like to talk about a kind of science which could have helped out very easily if it had been followed to try and identify who these people were. Uh, I am as much of an external observer as you are, so I clearly don't know whether these people are guilty or not. Uh, but if they had access to certain forms of testing and if they had used it vigorously, then I'm sure we might have heard a different tale. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, kind of DNA forensics, which many of you might be familiar with. Uh, and the origins of this has nothing to do with Watson and Crick discovering the double helical structure. But whenever DNA comes up, probably Watson and Crick are the first picture that appears, almost like a Google search. That's the first thing that appears. So I thought it's, it's customary to put up their picture. Uh, so the DNA that's present in our cells, uh, almost all of our DNAs are the same. And that's not a scandalous statement to make. It is the truth nearly 98 to 99% of all of our DNAs in this room are the same and that holds true for almost all of humanity as well. Uh, what we are looking at differences when we are trying to identify the DNA fingerprint of an individual is present at a very specific site, is present on very specific types of DNA on individuals. And this analogy is best understood by looking at the comparison between the books in a library and the DNA which is packaged in such format in our cells, right? So our body is made of cells, which is made up of different nuclei, has different chromosomes, and eventually you have the DNA nucleotides. And even the most uh, hardcore of you engineers out there are probably aware of A, T, G, and C without knowing what they actually mean. Those are the DNA nucleotides which are right at the end, which somewhat are like uh, letters in a word, though not exactly, but sort of conveys the spirit. So if you put things together, you would eventually be able to build up and build up the entire library, which our bodies are, uh, metaphorically speaking. So what people are talking about 
when they're talking about DNA fingerprints are specific sites on regions of our DNA which are different, which are just different. Nobody really knows the reason why. And so the question why in this particular context has not been answered yet successfully. Uh, we don't know the reason why there are small parts of our DNA which are different, but they just are. So locus or those sites where these sites, where these DNA are different are known. Uh, countries use different sets of loci. The US uses certain sets of locus. The European Union uses a certainly different set. Uh, but we have a sense of what those sites are on our chromosomes, uh, in our cells, uh, from our tissues, from our body, which have different pieces of DNA in them, different types of DNA in them. And these pieces of DNA are different from a very, very literal and trivial sense. They are different because of their length. They are different because of a small difference or small differences in their length. So this could be you, and this could be me, and this could be Krishna right here. And these three variations represent the different types of DNA that we have at a very specific site in our chromosome. So this is one particular locus which has been highlighted. And you just have, you have four, I have four, Krishna has six. You have two, I have three, Krishna has five, something like that. So we have a vast number of permutations and combinations possible for these variations which exist at these sites in our DNA. And you could possibly run them in a format which is very similar to chromatography that I mentioned in the first part. And you could separate that out. And the pattern that you get would be your DNA fingerprint. So this is DNA fingerprint for dummies kind of that you can use for understanding what is it that is being measured when you are, when people are talking about fingerprinting using DNA. Just to get into a little bit more detail, the variations in DNA are or have something to, that was very dramatic, that was something to do with the number of repeats. So all of us have these very symmetrical but very boring looking repeats of nucleotides. All of us have. What we have differently is the number. So you may have three, I may have three, Krishna may have four. Or you may have two, I may have three, Krishna may have five. And so the number of loci and the number of repeats at each of those loci are something which each person can be uniquely identified with, which is the basis of DNA fingerprinting. Right, so from the chromosomes that we have, we have 22 somatic chromosomes and we have a pair of sex chromosomes. The United States has identified 13 such marker locations which can be used for forensic fingerprinting, which means if you're able to extract some cells from the crime site, you can actually peep into the location that are marked in colors here. Peeping, I'm just, you know, metaphorically speaking, you can do something. You can actually check out what those DNA sequences are. And it is possible for us to separate out those DNA sequences in a chromatography format. And it's possible for us to actually measure what those sequence variations are. The sequence variations can be mapped in terms of the number of repeats. Right? So at the end of the day, even though I have studied so much, I've played a lot, I have many hobbies, I work here, I enjoy being here, what I as an individual can be reduced to is a set of these numbers, which is the variations of the repeats at certain locations. That sounds very, very robotic and artificial intelligence sounding, which is that how can a human being be ultimately reduced to a set of numbers, but that's effectively what it comes down to. And these numbers can be stored in very simple text files, and that text file would be your identity, which nobody else could ever steal, uh, or at least pilfer, because if they did that, it wouldn't matter, because they would have a different identity by themselves. So the numbers here are referring to the numbers that would be entered into a DNA database. This is the fingerprint of an individual, the number of repeats at different sites across two chromosomes, across the uh, 13 different locations that the uh, FBI uses. We rely a bit on that and a bit on the European Union database. We don't have a database of our own in this country. Uh, and so you can actually set up a DNA fingerprint 
for any individual. Right, going back to the mystery now. So what would have been possible if the blood-soaked handprint was available? Well, first of all, it is evidence. If you've lost evidence, then you've lost the plot. So if you have evidence and you have one side completed, then you can try and compare the evidence with a standard set of markers which are present in a certain population, let's say the population of Gujarat or the population of Western India or the population of India, howsoever diverse that might be, you can compare the two. You can compare Q versus K. Q represents the set of numbers in a specific site or a sample, and K represents the larger profile which might be present in all individuals in that particular country. And you could come out and you could try and make the case for three different types of events. And those three events are either exclusion or non-exclusion or inconclusive. So lawyers, depending on which side they are fighting for, would either go for exclusion, either fight for exclusion, or they would try to go for inconclusive. The match is usually something which is self-evident. So once there is a match, there is a match. And you cannot really argue against the match because it is going to be almost incredibly difficult to say that somebody has corrupted information to intentionally match uh, the evidence that you got. This is how the three scenarios look like. The peaks that you're seeing are really the peak positions which happen in chromatography kind of formats. And you have non-exclusion uh, match or inclusion an inconclusive result. As I said, lawyers are usually looking for this as an excuse to not allow the DNA evidence to come in. And depending on which side your lawyer is, they could either be arguing for an exclusion or a no match or a non-exclusion or a match. So in this particular case, the blood that was, that was missed from the site that could have been used as an evidence could be used to present three different scenarios. I'll talk about those three different scenarios in a short while. Uh, the match probability is something that you have probably heard about. Whenever people talk about DNA fingerprinting and matching, they talk about, oh, it's, you know, this much is the probability. It's one in a million chance. It's one in a billion chance that such and such individual has that particular DNA. That is a very simple probability which is calculated by multiplying together the frequency of occurrence of some of these numbers that have been mentioned before, so the repeat sizes, what is the frequency of occurrence of that repeat size? So say you have, one of you have a repeat size of 10, and you are the only person in the entire country who has a repeat size of 10, then that means it's going to be very easy to identify you because the probability of the frequency of occurrence of that will be very, very small, and therefore it can be very easily matched to you. The cumulative frequency, the larger number of sets that you take, the frequency becomes more and more and therefore at the end when you take uh, all 13 of these locations, you have uh, numbers here, you have probabilities here which is more than the population of the earth and therefore if it's done correctly you can clearly pin down a person and conclusively say such and such person is responsible for this particular activity or the site at which they were present. All right, so there were three scenarios that I mentioned. What were these three scenarios? So three scenarios, you've kept an open mind and you're trying to find the scenarios or you're already biased and you're thinking that, okay, let me try to only go with one scenario and not the others. No, we look at three scenarios and look at what are the possibilities that the three scenarios would have shown. The first scenario is, uh, is telling us that they were complicit. Uh, whether they actually perform the murders or not is, is irrelevant. Maybe their blood is in that particular handprint that was missed, and that makes them complicit in the murders. Uh, if that was so, then clearly their DNA would have appeared in the blood-smeared handprint. And if that were so, that would be very easy to prove in a court of law that uh, they are not entirely innocent. They are probably complicit in the murders. The probability of match would be significant. Even if a few locations are used, the probability of matching this would be much more than the population of Delhi, and therefore it could be conclusively said that these two individuals were clearly on the terrace on the night of that particular fateful evening. Scenario two is when they were not complicit in these murders, and therefore their blood 
is not found as part of the smudged handprint. Uh, that again may or may not prove that they didn't do the murder, but just taking that evidence at face value, you are saying that no, since they were not present on the terrace, that excludes them from the murder site, and therefore they were not uh, part of the chain of events. And that happens because there are different numbers that has been extracted on the handprint versus different numbers that are present on uh, them as a person. So this matching becomes very easy once you have <coughs> identified what the locations are that you should be uh, looking at the allele sets. The third scenario is when they were involved and there were others as well who were involved, other people who may or may not have been identified and nabbed by the cops. And this is again part of evidence which could show that you have numbers which are matching, but there are also extra numbers which are not accounted for because there might be other people who have contributed their DNA to that smudged handprint. And therefore, those other people, since they have not been caught, they are not part of the uh, net, uh, they're not part of the suspect list, and they have not been implicated yet, right? So one single piece of evidence, three scenarios are laid out, and based on the other evidence, the other forensic evidence that can be used, you can then use that to digest the case and take it forward. Is that all? No, that's not all. So I've just only highlighted a very small aspect of this case and the botch up that followed, there are other things that could have been very easily worked out, such as the blood alcohol content of one of the individuals, which was supposedly high, that could have been identified quite easily from the smudged handprint that was collected. There were traces of narcotic substances that could strengthen or weaken the case, depending on who the suspects were, uh, that were eventually charged by the cops and traces of medication that the couple was reported to have taken, again, could have conclusively proved or disproved their claims of being innocent. Uh, eventually, of course, the couple has been acquitted, though not entirely because of the scientific reasons that have been pointed out. They have been acquitted because of a generic ineptness which was shown in the investigation that was performed, uh, which was taken as not being substantive enough in implicating them from the crime. Okay, my time's up, that's why they're buzzing me. Whoever that is, that's scary. Uh, so this is all lost thanks to uh, people who were not doing their work, though they should have, uh, in spite of tools being available and in spite of processes being available, uh, none of this uh, could be brought to fruition. It is possible this remains a mystery, as I said. It was a mystery, it's still a mystery as to who committed these crimes. Some of this may not have been so if a proper methodology was followed. So in conclusion, this is something that has been picked out from the investigating agency's closure report of this particular crime. Uh, all of this, you can take a minute or so to read it. Uh, but just to summarize here, so the second paragraph is my summary of what they are saying. Uh, they're saying that yes, there was a certain match that was obtained from different DNA samples which were obtained from the homes. And uh, these did match the household helps uh, as such. Uh, unfortunately, he also was killed. So it's not clear then how could he have done both. Uh, and it was not a suicide uh, either. So there's clearly something that is being missed uh, because of all of this. All right, so I had said that <laughs> I will not highlight things from the second mystery, things which could be of relevance for interns, for researchers, for people who are trying to solve mysteries. Outside.